I'd like to tell you about the strangest secret in the world. Not long ago, Albert Schweitzer, the great doctor and Nobel Prize winner, was being interviewed in London, and a reporter asked him, Doctor, what's wrong with men today? The great doctor was silent a moment, and then he said, Men simply don't think. And it's about this that I want to talk with you. We live today in a golden age. This is an era that man has looked forward, dreamed of, and worked toward for thousands of years. But since it's here, we pretty well take it for granted. We in America are particularly fortunate to live in the richest land that ever existed on the face of the earth, a land of abundant opportunity for everyone. But do you know what happens? Let's take a hundred men who start even at the age of 25. Do you have any idea what will happen to those men by the time they're 65? These 100 men who all start even at the age of 25 believe they're going to be successful. If you ask any one of these men if he wanted to be a success, he'd tell you that he did. And you'd notice that he was eager toward life, that there was a certain sparkle to his eye, an erectness to his carriage, and life seemed like a pretty interesting adventure to him. But by the time they're 65, one will be rich, four will be financially independent, five will still be working, 54 will be broke. Now think a moment. Out of the 100, only five make the grade. Why do so many fail? What has happened to the sparkle that was there when they were 25? What's become of the dreams, the hopes, the plans? And why is there such a large disparity between what these men intended to do and what they actually accomplished? When we say about 5% achieve success, we have to define success. And here's the definition. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. If a man is working toward a predetermined goal and knows where he's going, that man is a success. If he's not doing that, he's a failure. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Rollo May, the distinguished psychiatrist, wrote a wonderful book called Man's Search for Himself. And in this book he says, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice, it is conformity. And there you have the trouble today. It's conformity. People acting like everyone else, without knowing why, without knowing where they're going. Now think of it. In America right now, there are over 14 million people, 65 years of age and over. And about 13 million of these 14 million are broke. They're dependent on someone else for life's necessities. Now we learn to read by the time we're seven. We learn to make a living by the time we're 25. Usually, by that time, we're not only making a living, we're supporting a family. And yet, by the time we're 65, we haven't learned how to become financially independent in the richest land that has ever been known. Why? We conform. And the trouble is that we're acting like the wrong percentage group, the 95% who don't succeed. Now, why do these people conform? Well, they don't know, really. These people believe that their lives are shaped by circumstances, by things that happen to them by exterior forces. They're outer-directed people. A survey was made one time that covered a lot of men, working men, and these men were asked this question. Why do you work? Why do you get up in the morning? Nineteen out of twenty had no idea. If you ask them, they'll say, everyone goes to work in the morning. And that's the reason they do it, because everyone else is doing it. Now let's get back to our definition of success. Who succeeds? The only man who succeeds is the man who is progressively realizing a worthy ideal. He's the man who says, I'm going to become this, and then begins to work toward that goal. I'll tell you who the successful people are. A success is the school teacher who's teaching school because that's what she wanted to do. The success is the woman who's a wife and mother because she wanted to become a wife and mother and is doing a good job of it. The success is the man who runs the corner gas station because that's what he wanted to do. The success is the successful salesman who wants to become a top-notch salesman and grow and build with his organization. A success is anyone who is doing deliberately a predetermined job because that's what he decided to do deliberately. But only one out of 20 does that. That's why today there isn't really any competition unless we make it for ourselves. Instead of competing, all we have to do is create. Now for 20 years I looked for the key which would determine what would happen to a human being. Was there a key I wanted to know which would make the future a promise that we could foretell to a large extent? Was there a key that would guarantee a person's becoming successful if he only knew about it and knew how to use it? Well, there is such a key, and I've found it. 
Have you ever wondered why so many men work so hard and honestly without ever achieving anything in particular, and others don't seem to work hard and yet seem to get everything? They have the magic touch. You've heard them say that about someone. Everything he touches turns to gold. And have you ever noticed that a man who becomes successful tends to continue to become successful? And on the other hand, have you noticed how a man who is a failure tends to continue to fail? It's because of goals. Some of us have them, some don't. People with goals succeed because they know where they're going. Now think of a ship leaving a harbor, and think of it with the complete voyage mapped out and planned. The captain and crew know exactly where it's going and how long it will take. It has a definite goal. 9,999 times out of 10,000, it will get to where it started out to get. Now let's take another ship, just like the first, only let's not put a crew on it or a captain at the helm. Let's give it no aiming point, no goal, no destination. We just start the engines and let it go. I think you'll agree with me that if it gets out of the harbor at all, it will either sink or wind up on some deserted beach a derelict. It can't go any place because it has no destination and no guidance. It's the same with a human being. Take the salesman, for example. There is no other person in the world today with the future of a good salesman. Selling is the world's highest paid profession, if we're good at it and if we know where we're going. Every company needs top-notch salesmen, and they reward those men. The sky is the limit for them. But how many can you find? Someone once said, the human race is fixed, not to prevent the strong from winning, but to prevent the weak from losing. The American economy today can be likened to a convoy in time of war. The entire economy is slowed down to protect its weakest link, just as the convoy had to go at the speed that would permit its slowest vessel to remain in formation. That's why it's so easy to make a living today. It takes no particular brains or talent to make a living and support a family today. So we have a plateau of so-called security, if that's what a person's looking for, but we do have to decide how high above this plateau we want to aim for. Now let's get back to the strangest secret in the world, the story that I wanted to tell you today. Why do men with goals succeed in life and men without them fail? Well, let me tell you something which, if you really understand it, will alter your life immediately. If you understand completely what I'm going to tell you from this moment on, your life will never be the same again. You'll suddenly find that good luck just seems to be attracted to you. The things you want just seem to fall in line. And from now on, you won't have the problems, the worries, the gnawing lump of anxiety that perhaps you've experienced before. Doubt, fear, well, they'll be things of the past. Here's the key to success and the key to failure. We become what we think about. Now, let me say that again. We become what we think about. Throughout all history, the great wise men and teachers, philosophers and prophets have disagreed with one another on many different things. It is only on this one point that they are in complete and unanimous agreement. Listen to what Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman emperor, said. He said, a man's life is what his thoughts make of it. Disraeli said this, everything comes if a man will only wait. I have brought myself by long meditation to the conviction that a human being with a settled purpose must accomplish it, and that nothing can resist a will that will stake even existence for its fulfillment. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, a man is what he thinks about all day long. William James said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. And he also said, we need only in cold blood act as if the thing in question were real, and it will become infallibly real by growing into such a connection with our life that it will become real. It will become so knit with habit and emotion that our interest in it will be those which characterize belief. He also said this, if you only care enough for a result, you will almost certainly attain it. If you wish to be rich, you will be rich. If you wish to be learned, you will be learned. If you wish to be good, you will be good. Only you must then really wish these things and wish them exclusively and not wish at the same time a hundred other incompatible things just as strongly. In the Bible you read in Mark 9:23, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale said this, this is one of the greatest laws in the universe. 
fervently do I wish I had discovered it as a very young man. It dawned upon me much later in life, and I've found it to be one of the greatest, if not my greatest discovery, outside of my relationship to God. And the great law, briefly and simply stated, is that if you think in negative terms, you'll get negative results. If you think in positive terms, you will achieve positive results. That is the simple fact, which is at the basis of an astonishing law of prosperity and success. In three words, believe and succeed. William Shakespeare put it this way, Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. George Bernard Shaw said, People are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want, and if they can't find them, make them. Well, it's pretty apparent, isn't it? And every person who discovered this, for a while believed, that he was the first one to work it out. We become what we think about. Now it stands to reason that a person who's thinking about a concrete and worthwhile goal is going to reach it because that's what he's thinking about. And we become what we think about. Conversely, the man who has no goal, who doesn't know where he's going and whose thoughts must therefore be thoughts of confusion and anxiety and fear and worry, becomes what he thinks about. His life becomes one of frustration, fear, anxiety and worry. And if he thinks about nothing, he becomes nothing. Now, how does it work? Why do we become what we think about? Well, I'll tell you how it works, as far as we know. Now, to do this, I want to tell you about a situation that parallels the human mind. Suppose a farmer has some land, and it's good fertile land. Now, the land gives the farmer a choice. He may plant in that land whatever he chooses. The land doesn't care. It's up to the farmer to make the decision. Now, remember, we're comparing the human mind with the land, because the mind, like the land, doesn't care what you plant in it. It will return what you plant but it doesn't care what you plant. Now let's say that the farmer has two seeds in his hand. One is a seed of corn, the other is nightshade, a deadly poison. He digs two little holes in the earth and he plants both seeds, one corn, the other nightshade. He covers up the holes, waters and takes care of the land and what will happen? Invariably, the land will return what is planted. As it's written in the Bible, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Remember, the land doesn't care. It will return poison in just as wonderful abundance as it will corn. So up come the two plants, one corn, one poison. Now, the human mind is far more fertile, far more incredible and mysterious than the land, but it works the same way. It doesn't care what we plant. Success, failure. A concrete worthwhile goal or confusion, misunderstanding, fear, anxiety, and so on. But what we plant, it will return to us. You see, the human mind is the last great unexplored continent on the earth. It contains riches beyond our wildest dreams. It will return anything we want to plant. Now you might say, well, if that's true, why don't people use their minds more? Well, I think they've figured out an answer to that too. Our mind comes as standard equipment at birth. It's free, and things that are given to us for nothing, we place little value on. Things that we pay money for, we value. The paradox is that exactly the reverse is true. Everything that's really worthwhile in life came to us free. Our mind, our soul, our body, our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, our intelligence, our love of family and children and friends. All these priceless possessions are free, but the things that cost us money are actually very cheap and can be replaced at any time. A good man can be completely wiped out and make another fortune. He can do that several times. Even if our home burns down, we can rebuild it. But the things we got for nothing, we can never replace. The human mind isn't used merely because we take it for granted. Familiarity breeds contempt. It can do any kind of job we assign to it, but generally speaking, we use it for little jobs instead of big important ones. Universities have proved that most of us are operating on about 10% of our abilities. Decide now, what is it you want? Plant your goal in your mind. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. Do you want to be an outstanding salesman, a better worker at your particular job? Do you want to go places in your company, in your community? All you've got to do is plant that seed in your mind. Care for it. Work steadily toward your goal, and it will become a reality. It not only will, there's no way that it cannot. You see, that is a law, like the laws of Sir Isaac Newton, the laws of gravity. 
If you get on top of a building and jump off, you'll always go down. You'll never go up. And it's the same with all the other laws of nature. They always work. They're inflexible. Think about your goal in a relaxed, positive way. Picture yourself in your mind's eye as having already achieved this goal. See yourself doing the things you will be doing when you've reached your goal. Ours has been called the phenobarbital age, the age of ulcers and nervous breakdowns. At a time when medical research has raised us to a new plateau of good health and longevity, far too many of us worry ourselves into an early grave trying to cope with things in our own little personal ways, without learning a few great laws that will take care of everything for us. These things we bring on ourselves through our habitual way of thinking. Every one of us is the sum total of his own thoughts. He is where he is because that ex is exactly where he really wants to be, whether he'll admit that or not. Each of us must live off the fruit of his thoughts in the future, because what you think today and tomorrow, next month and next year, will mold your life and determine your future. You're guided by your mind. I remember one time I was driving through Arizona and I saw one of those giant earth-moving machines roaring along the road at about 35 miles an hour with what looked like 20 tons of dirt in it, a tremendous, incredible machine, and there was a little man perched way up on top with the wheel in his hands guiding it. And as I drove along, I was struck by the similarity of that machine to the human mind. Just suppose you're sitting at the controls of such a vast source of energy. Are you going to sit back and fold your arms and let it run itself into a ditch? Or are you going to keep both hands firmly on the wheel and control and direct this power to a specific worthwhile purpose? It's up to you. You're in the driver's seat. You see, the very law that gives us success is a two-edged sword. We must control our thinking. The same rule that can lead a man to a life of success, wealth, happiness, and all the things he's ever dreamed of for himself and his family that very same law can lead him into the gutter. It's all in how he uses it, for good or for bad. This is the strangest secret in the world. Now, why do I say it's strange, and why do I call it a secret? Actually, it isn't a secret at all. It was first promulgated by some of the earliest wise men, and it appears again and again throughout the Bible. But very few people have learned it, understand it. That's why it's strange, and why, for some equally strange reason, it virtually remains a secret. I believe that you could go out and walk down the main street of your town and ask one man after another what the secret of success is, and you probably wouldn't run into one man in a month who could tell you. Now, this information is enormously valuable to us, if we really understand it and apply it. It's valuable to us not only for our own lives, but the lives of those around us, our family, employees, associates, and friends. Life should be an exciting adventure. It should never be a bore. A man should live fully, be alive. He should be glad to get out of bed in the morning. He should be doing a job he likes to do because he does it well. One time I heard Grove Patterson make a speech, the editor-in-chief of the Toledo Daily Blade, and as he concluded his speech, he said something that I've never forgotten. He said something like this. My years in the newspaper business have convinced me of several things. Among them, that people are basically good, and that we came from someplace, and we're going someplace. So we should make our time here an exciting adventure. The architect of the universe didn't build a stairway leading nowhere. And the greatest teacher of all, the carpenter from the plains of Galilee, gave us the secret time and time again. As ye believe, so shall it be done unto you.